All right, we are live, guys, ready to jump into week five on becoming a worshiper. So grateful that you guys have made it. Did everybody survive uh, Coachella Fest traffic? You got another weekend of it, so, and then Stagecoach, so, you know, we always know. And they, they bring the, the most interesting weather into town. You ever notice that? Yeah, the weather is always interesting around Coachella Fest, so. Uh, and what a wonderful Sunday we had. Come on. 9 a.m. and our third 11 a.m. service was last Sunday, so can't wait to see as we grow it out and build it. Each week we got a few more people. Of course, we did great on Resurrection Sunday on Easter, but it was really great to see a few more people from the previous week at 11 a.m., and people are starting to land the plane of which service is going to be their service, so I'm grateful for that. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer as we get ready for week five on becoming a worshiper. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for leading us and guiding us into all truth. Father, we pray, Lord God, that we will become the kind of disciple that walks in the footsteps of Jesus. We thank you that we learn to be worshipers, Father, just as we learn to be givers and lovers of God and lovers of his people. Now we want to worship our God and be affectionate and adamant in our worship so that other people will see that a life of worship is a life of service. So we're serving God with gladness. And Father, it's not just the singing we do or the dancing or the praising. Father, it's the service that we give, that we are worshipers of God 24-7. Thank you, Lord God, that we get opportunities to serve you in our families, in our in our jobs, in our businesses, in the daily activities that we do throughout the day, and especially when we're in the house of the Lord, or even in a primary office like we are today. Thank you, Lord God, for opportunities to be your worshiper, to be your servant, Father. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, this week is how to become a someone who is devoted to God and expresses a lifestyle of adoration and gratitude in every area of life. Notice that. So worship is not just about singing a few songs, three songs on a Sunday or four songs on a Wednesday at Indio campus. No, it's more about giving glory to God in all that you do expressing gratitude and praise throughout the day, and also doing things that show that you are a worshiper, which means you are a servant of the Lord. The word worship and service are the same. So even the priests in the temple, they were serving God in the temple, but they were actually worshiping God through their service. Okay, so let's jump in tonight and look at Jesus once again. How many know Jesus is the kind of leader we want to be and the worshiper we want to be? Because he said, we should worship God and him only. He was quoting Moses, right? And so as we jump into what it means to be a disciple tonight, we know that uh, this idea of worship is much more than just the singers, the worship team, and those kind of people that lead on the stage. Because I think sometimes people assume worship is a song. And really it's much more than that. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at worshiper tonight. Uh, let's see. Jesus is our example here. Jesus has an interesting encounter with a Samaritan woman that teaches us how to become a worshiper of God. He traveled with his disciples down a dusty road from, watch this, Jerusalem to Galilee, right? Um, so actually, um, it's actually supposed to be Jericho, I just realized. Yeah, so that's actually, he he lived in the Galilee, but really the Samaritan, oh, you know what? No, let me take that back. I'm, my, my brain is jumping ahead to uh, another parable to the one with the Good Samaritan. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the, I, my brain, look how quickly my brain just associated, wait a minute, Good Samaritan, Samaritan woman. No, let me stay on course. Let me read it just like it was worded. As he traveled with his disciples down a dusty road from where? Jerusalem to Galilee, right? He chose a route through Samaria. The disciples went into a certain city to buy food, and Jesus was left alone, thirsty from his journey. At the famous well of his forefather Jacob, it's called Jacob's Well, he asked the Samaritan woman to give him a drink of water. As the conversation revealed political and racial tensions between Jews and Samaritans, Jesus began to speak to into this woman's life, giving her the solution to her problems as living water to her thirsty soul. This scenario is the setting for Jesus' famous words about worship. Now, here's the words that we read in John chapter 4, verses 
verse 23 through 24. These are the words spoken to this Samaritan woman. But the time is coming, he says to her. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in what? In spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, God is a spirit. How do you worship God? Well, your spirit has to be engaged in worship to God who is a spirit because worship is on a spiritual level. Wor worship is a spiritual connection to God as your Father in heaven. The Father is looking for these kind of worshipers, these people that are connected to him in the spirit. So our spirit and his spirit have to be one. So we see in verse 24, for, the, for God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, if we compare that to what we see in Romans 12, 1, especially in the CSB translation, Paul, the apostle, says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I shared this, mes this message, I think Sunday we use this, I urge you to present your bodies, oh, no, I did this Saturday at the synagogue, to present your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. So think about this. To worship in spirit and in truth is to offer God true worship. If there's true worship, then the opposite can also be discussed. What is vain worship? Worship that is not true. Worship that is empty of truth. Worship that is void of truth. So sometimes people have religious systems that are void of truth. People might even worship things that are not even described in the Bible to be worshiped. I know if a person worships a head of lettuce, that becomes their God, right? You know, I mean, I remember a TV show one time where that was the topic. Um, I forget what the show was, but it was about a head of lettuce being worshiped by this cult. And uh, they would call the head of lettuce their God. They'd put the head of lettuce on the table, and they would all worship the head of lettuce. And you think it's funny, but you'd be amazed at the things that people worship idols that they created, things that they made with their own hands, they would worship them, and even making people an idol. Yeah. We never want to make people an idol of worship when there's only one God that we should be worshiping, and he wants true worship. So let's do our fill-ins tonight. We see that God is seeking for what kind of worshipers? True worshipers. True worshipers. Very clear from John 4, 23 and 24. And then from that same verse, we find out that we worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. We worship him in spirit and in truth. You guys are in perfect timing to get the fill-ins tonight. All right, so number three then is coming from the Romans passage. We present our bodies as what? Living sacrifice. So we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Did you guys get your books and stuff? Okay, good. Um, so what page are we on for that fill-in? 55. 55, okay. So we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And then the last one is that true worship is holy and pleasing to God. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. True worship is holy and pleasing to God. Now, we want to always make sure we're pleasing to God. And what we offer up to God is described as like an offering in the Old Testament like an, an, a lamb or a ram or a goat or a bull or pigeons or turtle doves that were offered in specific offerings called a burnt offering that was offered before God. It was offered with a sweet-smelling aroma. And so the writer of Romans here, even John's epistle, is talking about this worship at the temple where they would bring sacrifices, they would bring offerings. And our body is to become a living sacrifice like we lay our life down on the altar and we become that. Now, I'm actually in a series, if you want to learn more about this, I'm in a series on Saturdays at the synagogue, and I put this on Facebook and YouTube, about a living sacrifice. So that's exactly the topic of the series we've been in on Saturdays. So just scroll through all of my stuff, you'll see the link, especially on Facebook or on YouTube, you'll see that we're in that series, and it's a live broadcast. So you'll see it under live, not videos. Uh, so, very important that you understand what it means to be a living sacrifice. The idea is the same way the animal was laid on the altar and it was sacrificed, the flesh would die. 
and the spiritual essence of that aroma would go up to God in worship. Spiritually, that's what happens to you. God wants your spiritual worship, because remember, only your spirit can worship God who is a spirit. But your flesh has to die to yourself, selfishness, selfish ways, selfish things you've done in the past. And Paul said that he died daily. He didn't mean physically die, but he means in his fleshly, carnal nature. The behavior that we all grew up with as a Dennis the Menace growing up, right? <laughs> Even you ladies, you know. Uh, you might not have been a Dennis the Menace, but you maybe were a Denise the Menace. I don't know, but you have to consider the fact that there's part of your flesh that has to die so that your spirit can have that new resurrection of life, right? So the concept is a sacrifice on the altar. So let's take a look at what worship is. Worship is more than just singing or playing instruments in praise to God. On the contrary, worship includes total surrender and service to God. Remember I said the word for worship, both in Hebrew and in Greek, is the same word for service. And the example we use, just like we use the animals on the altar, right, as a sacrifice, the priests would offer up these offerings, and when they did it, they were serving God in the temple. They were serving God in the days of Moses in the tabernacle, right? Tabernacle of Moses, Temple of Solomon, and then later Herod's temple. Same three rooms, outer court, inner court of holy place and holy of holies. Three rooms, they would take the animal sacrifice from the outer court and take the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And this was a whole process of worship. And most people, until they've done a study of the tabernacle, they don't understand what worship is because they think worship is singing. They think worship is praising, clapping, stomping your foot, you know, just having some expression of praise. And while that is a part of you praising God, it's not the real meaning of the word worship. So worship and praise are actually different. Okay. Now, I'll tell you the way they taught me growing up, and I don't think it was very accurate. But it is interesting that we tend to do this. We say, well, praise is all the fast songs. Those are the praise songs. And then the worship songs are the slower songs. In fact, we usually categorize them, categorize them as, well, those are worship songs. They're usually the slower songs with a beautiful melody, right? But all the fast beat songs, those are the praise songs, right? Praise him in the dance. Praise him. It was very demonstrative, right? Especially if you go to a Pentecostal church or one of those shouting Baptist church, you know, where you're, you know, praising the Lord very demonstratively. And maybe there's a big choir and you're, you're hearing seeing people with tambourines and the drummer's going and, you know, guitars are going and, you know, it could be in a, a his, yeah, trumpets. It could be Hispanic uh, church where it's more like, you know, uh, congas or, you know, some other, you know, timbales, you know, all kind of instruments that could be used in praise. While that is an expression of praise. It's not the essence of worship. Worship goes deeper. And I wish I had time to break out my felt board of Moses in the tabernacle, because that's how I used to teach Sunday school. I used to teach about Moses, how they'd bring the animal sacrifice, they would offer it up to God, and the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and you almost have to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark to appreciate what the Ark of the Covenant is. Anybody ever heard of Indiana Jones? You know, I dare you to rent that movie and watch it and just watch Raiders of the Lost Ark and you'll get a, a, a new appreciation of the presence of God that was surrounding that Ark. Nonetheless, what we read here in Scripture is that God, as our Maker, created us for this type of spiritual praise the Lord and magnify the Lord. Your body can enter into expressions of praise through the dance. You can lift your hands. But worship is more than a physical expression. Worship is an in, inner connection that your spirit has with God. Question? Wait, so you said, uh, what did you say about the spirit again? Can you rewind? Like, can, like, uh, like can, can I rewind? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, ask the question. What did you say again about the spirit just right now? The only part of you that can truly worship God, since God is a spirit, and he's looking for true worship, is worship from your spirit. Your spirit is the only part of you that can truly worship God in the full expression of worship. So when are you activating your spirit? Like, when are you using it? Like, when you're praying, when you're worshiping, or, like, you're only, are you always using your spirit? I don't know if you're using your spirit or your spirit's using you. Um, the real you is spirit. Right? 
You're a spiritual being on an earthly journey. And so your spirit is the real you that lives on when your body dies. And your spirit has been given a soul, which is the components of your mind, your emotions, your will for your spirit to interact with other human beings as well as communicate to people in the world in this physical realm. So you have a spirit and a soul, separate aspects of your inner man. Your spirit is the part of you created in the image of God. Your soul is the part of you that's been given to you that contains all of your natural characteristics and personality. And that helps you communicate to other people. See, if it was just God and us in this world, we would just need a spirit, a spiritual body, and just be spirits that talk to God in a spiritual connection. In fact, you don't even need words in the spirit. It's why God says he, he looks at the heart. Words can't always express what you really feel in your heart. You try to use words to express the deepest feelings you have in your heart. But your heart or your spiritual man doesn't need words. Our soul is what communicates the words, right? So before God said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? By speaking, in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth by saying, you know, not only that the, the world would be created, but there would be light. Before God spoke, what existed? Void. Like, I don't know what existed before the earth. Okay, so you said void, okay. Yeah. But I asked what existed, because void is not an existence. Void is the absence of light, right? The absence of substance, right? God did. Oh, so, okay. so God did. Well, that's because God is spirit, and spirit can't be destroyed. Spirit is like energy that just can be transferred from one existence to another, or like electricity. You can move it from one place to another, but power is power. Right. And the spiritual realm, God not only is a spirit that is self-existent, he doesn't need anybody to exist. He's not dependent on anyone. A child is dependent on their parent. God is not dependent on anyone. He is the almighty, self-sufficient El Shaddai. Because you're mad at God because well, I'm mad at God. Why did he allow this to happen in my life? God, well, God says when you finally realize that part of that you caused or your family caused or your environment caused or Adam caused, right? Cause and effect. You can't blame everything on God. But God is a spirit. He's beyond anything in this natural realm. And so our goal as newborn again believers is to keep our connection to God from his spirit to our spirit, from our spirit back to his spirit. So this is why the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside you. So he wants to live in your spirit. When you become a born again believer, when you accept Jesus, Yeshua as your Lord, you have allowed access for the spirit of God to dwell in you forever. Now, why does this happen? When God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, what do you think he breathed into him? Spirit. spirit. Why do we know that? God is not a man. He doesn't breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. You know, that's what humans do. We, we breathe in oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide. Plants are different, right? <laughs> they breathe in the carbon dioxide and they, they give us oxygen. That's why when you have plants in your house, it just kind of freshens, right? You know, the Garden of Eden was a beautiful place, had perfect oxygen. You know, there's oxygen bars, you can take oxygen. You wouldn't need that in the Garden of Eden. You're surrounded by pure, perfect oxygen. That's why there was no sickness or disease. Mm -hmm. There's no sickness or disease because you're living in a perfect environment with 100% pure oxygen. We live in smog, we live in, we got, we got ozone layers broken up, we got all kinds of problems, right? But imagine to live forever in a perfect environment, that was God's plan. That's what eternity will look like with a new heaven and new earth, right? So when you think about God, the connection we have with God, it's a spiritual connection. And this is why I, can't, I can teach you principles of 
what spirituality is versus carnality, but I can't make that connection for you. You have to accept that connection. Jesus wanted to be that connection. He's the door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He says, come on. Let me, let me be the way, truth, and life back to the Father so you can stay connected to him. Right. See, Jews already had a connection to their father. But in Jesus' time, they were disconnected after many years of slavery and exile. And so Jesus was trying to reconnect the nation back to the God who chose them and brought them out of Egypt. That's the call. And then all the nations that never knew him, that worshipped idols, he's saying, hey, you guys are welcome to come experience this too. I'm only using Israel as the model and the light to the other nations so they can come running and receive this salvation also. Amen. To restore them back in their connection with their father. So think about everything you do when it comes to spiritual growth is to reconnect you with your heavenly father. Anything that is carnality is trying to disconnect you from your Heavenly Father. Even too much time on social media can disconnect you from your Heavenly Father because it can take you down a path in an algorithm yeah. where now your mind is being bombarded by the things you're seeing and hearing and listening to that is just taking you completely off course from the devotion you had this morning when you were in the Word yeah. and you were in prayer. So be careful what you take in because your spirit receives everything. You know, your spirit knows everything about you. Because Paul said this to the Corinthians. He says, what, who knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Just like nobody knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So your spirit knows everything about you. You ever think about why some kids come out of the womb already having a disadvantage? Whatever that mama was going through, while she was pregnant with that child, if she was battered by her husband, if she was malnourished, if she did drugs, alcohol, any of those things, it not only affects the, the neurology and the physicality of the child, it can set them up for all kinds of problems, but spiritually, every negative thought, force, energy, uh, influence around that mama, the child is picking up on it. Fear. The Bible says the world has a spirit of fear. So the child that grows up in fear or in trauma, even before they leave the womb, already is set up for an insecurity. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, through childbearing there would be sorrow and sickness and pain. And the child's already feeling the pain when they come out. You ever notice why some kids come out, and they come out differently, one's more insecure, one's more confident? Yeah. Sometimes it has to do with nature, sometimes it's nurture. Sometimes it's environment, sometimes it's genetics, but a lot of emotional and spiritual activity around the mama will affect the child before they even come out the womb. And you'll notice certain kids are gonna come out, why is that kid so shy? You almost have to break them of that because you don't know the trauma that child was experiencing while they were in their mother's womb. Now here's the opposite. I know mothers that are godly women that have prayed over their womb and rubbed their belly and pray over their child and read books to their child, and read psalms to their child, and read the word of God to their child, and that child comes out so confident, so, so literate, so able to read and understand, because they already started their learning process because mama was talking to the child, praying over that child, speaking blessings over that child. So you have the power to use the word of God to create that kind of spiritual connection. I don't know why I'm going this, uh, this route, but this is for somebody tonight. <laughs> And there are so many things that will set you up for the enemy also when the child goes through trauma and negativity, even before the trauma of coming out of the womb, because there's, then there's a whole another level of trauma the enemy wants to cause on the child, whether it's abuse or abandonment, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, mental, whatever it is, even religious abuse. There's a lot of religious abuse in the world today. It will affect that child in years to come. But some of this is that uh, they're preset for this because the child grew up in a, in a generation where there's these generational curses. And I don't mean like there's a demon attached to the child. I'm not referring to that because people try to do that. I'm telling you that child grew up in a traumatic environment. For instance, mom and dad were not getting along. So you think, this is what parents always say. Well, the kid's not uh, able to understand what we're talking about. Well, no, they're just kids. So they cuss and yell and fight and curse each other out in front of the baby. Are you telling me that baby doesn't have ears? You don't think their first words are coming from what they're hearing from you? 
So be careful what you speak around your kids, let alone before they come out of the womb, you know, pray over that child. Lord, this child's going to be blessed. This child's going to have a, you know, a, a future and a hope. You promised this. And so when you think about what worship is, it's the spiritual connection you have with your father. The enemy wants to break the connection even before they get connected. So Adam actually had the breath of God, the wind of God, the spirit of God dwelling in him. When he sinned, he's like a balloon that's been deflated. He has a spirit, but it's empty. And it needs to be filled with the spirit of God. So we all have a spirit, soul, and body. The problem is if you're not a born again believer, if you're not accepted, you know, God back into your life through the work that Jesus has done, you have a tendency to be spiritually devoid of that life. Now I will say, Many religious expressions uh, and different denominations, different religions, try to tap into the spirit realm, mm -hmm. sometimes illegally, especially through witchcraft oh, yeah. and tarot cards and all this kind of stuff. They're trying to tap into the spirit realm, but through illegal means. Mm -hmm. Jesus gives legal access to God. Mm -hmm. He is the way, the truth, and life. He is the door, right? Yeah. So when people climb up some other way, like Jesus said, they're a thief and a robber. And so you have to go through the door. And so it's not that Jesus was trying to be exclusive. He was just saying these other religions are going through ways that are going to lead you in the wrong direction. So I want to, I want to show you the true path. This is the way to stay connected to your Father in worship. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right. Now, look at this wonderful Psalm 95, 6, and 7. It says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our what? Maker. maker. So notice God is our maker, our creator. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So the purpose for why our maker made us or created us was to worship. Come let us worship and bow down. Let's humble yourself before him. In fact, most of the time when worship is mentioned in the Old Testament, it's connected to bowing down or being prostrate on the ground. This is many times the posture of worship. Now Jews today don't do the bowing because they don't want to look like Muslims. Because there's been such a in many years past, there was a connection between, uh, obviously, Muhammad studied with rabbis and studied with the Jewish people and the people of the book. You know, he was reading the Bible, both Old and New Testament, when he, came, when he got his revelation, as he says, of the Quran. But the, they went in such different directions and became odds at each other that many times Jews tried to avoid the appearance of evil, so they don't want to look like they're bowing down to Allah. Mm -hmm. So they kind of stopped in many circles the, they do a bow, but they don't do the prostrate on the ground, like the Muslims do on the carpet. Um, but it, it, not to talk about religion so much, but it just know that in the Old Testament, whenever you saw the word worship, it usually was connected to some kind of sacrifice, laying the animal down on the altar, or symbolically kneeling before God or bowing before God, because those are postures of surrender, mm -hmm. to bow before him, to kneel before him. Okay? Now, if you think of how we relate to this, um, we need to decrease, and when we decrease, there is less focus on us and more focus on him. Everything we can do to bring glory to God. Everything we do can bring glory to our God. Worship involves total submission in every area, our spirit, soul, and body. So even though our spirit is the only one that can truly worship God in the full essence of worship, because he is a spirit, our soul and our body must be in alignment, right? Because our body is the temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. So as we become a disciple, we must seek to worship God as our Father from the spiritual core of our being as we are conformed to the image of Jesus. So here's the goal of worship. The goal of worship is to keep that, keep that spiritual connection between you and God. Now, the connection he wants you to have is He's the father, you're his child. Amen. If you just always remember that, there's a level of intimacy that we can experience. So we're going to jump into our questions tonight. Um, what did Jesus mean by spirit and truth? Now, we're going to take that and break it down into specifically. What does it mean for that God is a spirit, right? We kind of talked about a little bit about that tonight. How do we worship God in spirit? Third, how do we worship God in truth? Why does it say spirit and and truth. There is also a fourth question here. How can you lay your life down as a living sacrifice to glorify God in all that you do? So keep in mind, the concept of worship is a picture of the priest taking the animal that the 
the worshiper brought and laying it down on the altar. They can't bring dead animals. They have to bring live animals. And the animal has to be willing to lay its life down the way Isaac was willing to lay his life down when God commanded Abraham to offer up his son. Now, obviously, God didn't require that. A ram was caught in the bush. The <coughs> angel said, don't kill your son. It was just really a test. Sometimes it feels like a cruel test, but you have to understand those days. They're pretty demonstrative days where you did things to really prove things or show things in a demonstrative way. We probably wouldn't do that today. I probably, I don't think God would tell anybody, uh, uh, get ready to kill your child. You know, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. You have to understand the culture of the day. Yeah, some Jews even say that God wanted to prove to Abraham in this new walk with me, in this connection with me, you'll never do what the pagans do. They offer up their kids as sacrifices. So the fact that my angel stopped you is to show you that you won't have to. But for you and I, we can also see another layer of understanding. That one day, Jesus, as the son of the father, would be willing to be that sacrifice. So he would be our ram in the bush. Or as Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb. Now, you know, Passover is coming on Monday, and we won't meet. So write this down in your calendar, just as a reminder. The 22nd of April, we will not meet. If you haven't already pre-purchased your tickets for Passover, it's already sold out. But I'm going to be in Hemet celebrating the Passover with some of the people that are on the Dream Team. They're coming with us, about six people. And we're going to not be here the 22nd, but we will be here the following week, the 29th. Okay? So, um, and we'll try to figure out how we're going to catch up and be in sync with the other campuses. All right, so let's see if we can ask these questions tonight. Okay, we've got um, three possible leaders tonight. Um, why don't we have, um, let's see. I know for conversation's sake, it would almost be good if we, if we were a little bit separate from each other. Um, so how many people do we have tonight? What's the head count? Twelve, and that's including the leader, so minus um, the three, so that's what, nine? So we'll have three people in each group for each leader. Okay, so um, why don't you three go with Kim back there, and I'll take this group over here, but I'm going to have to split one of you up, to so you have, so actually, no, I don't need to be, I actually need to have Richard come over. Richard, you come over and do this group. And how about I just join this group over here? Okay, so come join this group over here, Richard. And we're going to ask these questions. So your table guide will lead you in the questions. And uh, I'm going to jump in over here with Barbara and see if we can razzle-dazzle some ideas today. Razzle-dazzle. Razzle-dazzle. <clears throat> so you can go ahead and start with the first one. What does it mean for God? That God is a spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Y
One minute left, guys. Time. Finish that last sentence. All right, good job, guys. All right, quick, quick question. What does it mean for God to be a spirit? What does it mean that he is a spirit? What's the opposite of him being flesh? flesh. So God is not a man. God is not flesh, right? Not referring to Jesus, who is the word who became flesh. That's a different revelation. But God the Father is not a human being. God the Father is not flesh and blood. He is spirit, which also means he's not temporal. He's eternal. Okay? If he's eternal, where is he? Everywhere. Everywhere. Where can you worship him? Everywhere. Everywhere and anywhere. Why do we know this is one of the focuses? The woman said to him, you Jews say Jerusalem is the only place to worship, only place to worship. She was referring to the temple in Jerusalem that Jews would travel to to go have corporate worship for feast days and Jewish holidays or holy days. 
But that's not necessarily worship. That was a holy convocation, a holy sacred gathering. But she was misconstruing, thinking that Jews only worship in Jerusalem. Can you imagine? So that means only the Jews who live in Jerusalem can worship God? What if you lived in the Galilee? You're going to have to travel there every day? Can you imagine schlepping back and forth between Galilee and Jerusalem? That's all big travel. That's like going from here to L.A. back and forth. I mean, it's just impossible. Doesn't God know we got traffic you know, <laughs> and Coachella Fest traffic at, at, at best, right? No, you have to understand that it was the fact that she was trying to pin it to a location. And when Jesus said, don't you know God is a spirit? And those who worship him in spirit and truth. In other words, worship is not a place or a location. It's a posture of our spiritual man to know we're in alignment with God. And it's not based upon racism that only Jews know about. He goes, yeah, Jews uh, were the ones that cried out to God for salvation. So he says salvation is of the Jews. Meaning the reason God saved Israel is because they cried out to him when they were in Egypt, when they were in bondage. So when God delivered Israel from Egypt and Pharaoh's bondage, when they came out and they wandered in the wilderness, God had to set up a place of worship called the tabernacle. Then we got to the promised land. He allowed them to build a permanent temple. The Romans um, destroyed the last temple, the one that Jesus grew up in. But prior to that, there was another temple called the original temple was Solomon's temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. So even though the temple was destroyed, that doesn't mean we can't worship God. So she, Jesus was addressing the fact that this woman had it twisted. Yeah. Oh, you think worship is a location. You think it's a position. You think it's a, a nationality. Because when she started doing the racial thing of, well, you Jews say this, but, you know, we worship in this mountain. The mountain she was talking about is a mountain that was used by God for Israel to put some of the commandments on. And it was considered the one all the blessings would go on. And then all of the breaking of those, those commandments or curses that would come upon them if they disobeyed were put on another mountain nearby. So they were using the blessed mountain for the Samaritan worship. And it's interesting, Samaritans still have their form of Passover and, and holidays, much like the Jews. And they still sacrifice lambs. Jews don't because they don't have the temple to do the sacrifice and have it inspected by the priests. So Jews eat roasted chicken or roasted brisket or, you know, some other roast. If you're a Spanish Jew, you eat lamb because you're in Spain and you're too far from Jerusalem anyway. So you never had the custom of going to Jerusalem because it was too far to travel back and forth. Uh, and it was a very dangerous ride. So you have to think about the concept of what Jesus was saying to a Samaritan. She was getting racial, right? She even brought up gender, right? And, and here as a woman... You know, she's talking to Jesus, thinking, why are you even talking to me? I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman, right? And so Jesus says, yeah, we're going to stop this conversation right now because where this is going, it might lead up to be like the other men that you have seduced. And the fact is, I, you, go need to get, you need to get your husband. So she calls, he calls for the husband, and, you know, she goes, I don't have one. And he's, he says, you're right. <laughs> and the one you're with now is not your husband. Because you've had five so far, and you're on number six. I'm not about to be number seven. Because think about it, she always meets these men probably at the well where people are thirsty. That old thirsty girl, that girl is thirsty. Looking for a relation, looking for love in all the wrong places, right? So you got to realize that Jesus said these words that don't you know God is a spirit, meaning you can worship anywhere. And then he prophesies. He says, don't you know there's coming a time where we're not even going to even worship in this mountain in Jerusalem? Because he was referring to the fact that it would be destroyed like he did in Matthew 24. The Romans would destroy the temple. There would be a time that they would be destroyed. And to this day, there's still a destroyed temple. When you go to Jerusalem, you see the, some of the walls, the retaining wall of the temple, but you see Jerusalem with walls torn down. And uh, it's still there for you to see because Jerusalem is a city built upon a city, built upon a city. You know, it's a city that cannot be hid, but it's a city that has been rebuilt on top of itself many years. And so you can do archaeology and investigations underneath the rubble, but some of that you can't do because of the temple, the Dome of the Rock, mosque. The Arabs don't want any of that going on 
to dig, and so they try to destroy all the artifacts. Mm. And Israelis don't really have the full right to worship on the Temple Mount because of that gold dome there, mm. because that's Muslim mm. territory for worship. And so this becomes this tension. And uh, interesting, um, yeah, so Mount Moriah. So basically that's the story of Abraham and the first place of worship. In fact, did you know Mount Moriah is the very place where Solomon built the temple? Solomon built the temple on the same spot that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac. And what did Abraham tell Isaac? And the other, the other servants, he says, we're going to go up and worship. Up this mountain to go worship the Lord. And that actual mountain became the temple mount where the temple stands and where Jews still pray at the Wailing Wall. It's the same place that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac. It's amazing when you study the story of the Bible. So that's one of the things we have to understand. Now, what does it worship, mean to worship God in spirit? That means we must worship him with our what? Our, our spirit, because our spirit is the only part that can really be in worship with God or in connection with God as our father. Because remember, the reason for that is if the connection is that God is your father, the spirit of God comes in and you cry, Abba, Father, by the spirit of adoption, by the spirit of the Lord. So your spirit is crying out to your father in heaven, Abba. Abba. That's the same way a child calls your father. It's the same way an adult male calls your father or a woman calls your father. Abba. You call him Abba. And that's what you're calling God. Dad. Daddy. Papi. You're calling out to God. Your spirit is saying, finally, I have an identity. I have my heavenly father. Amen. See, think about some young man that doesn't have a father in the home and he feels like his identity is affected by not having dad. But when you become a believer, God becomes your father. And then he puts spiritual fathers in your life to help you grow spiritually. Amen? All right. So let's see if we can fill in our core value tonight, which is holiness is our lifestyle. Because we say with holiness being our lifestyle, we live to glorify God in all that we do. In other words, worship is not just a few songs you sing before the preaching. It's you glorifying God in all that you do. Your worship glorifies God. And it's not just in church that you glorify God. You glorify God in all that you do, which means you should worship God all day in what you're doing, at your job. You serve God by serving the people that you're supposed to be serving and taking care of the needs of the community and needs of the people that are coming to you and to your business. But glorify God in all that you do. Give God the glory. And then it will keep you from saying things you shouldn't be saying, doing things you shouldn't be doing, because if it doesn't give God glory, you shouldn't be doing it. It's a good checklist to say, okay, that's uh, not giving glory to God, so I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't do that. God gets no glory out of that. Right? Okay, so here's a great verse. Um, it says, Psalm 86, 8 through 10, Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. He means the gods and the idols that the people made of the different nations. He says, Nor are there any works like your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and what? Worship before you, not just Israel, all nations. He says, O Lord, and shall glorify your what? Your name. So notice worship is connected to glorifying God's name, giving God glory. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Amen. Here's another great word out of the book of Revelation. John wrote this, John, the disciple of Jesus. Revelation 15, 3, it says that in, this is referring to a time period that we call the tribulation period, and at the end of it, there'll be this rejoicing in heaven. It says these people that are redeemed in heaven, they will sing the song of Moses. Notice it goes all the way back to Moses. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb, that's Jesus, saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, meaning reverence you, O Lord, and glorify your name. There it is again. For you alone are holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Wait a minute, did you just catch that? John is basically saying the words of Psalm 86, because he says they're all going to worship and glorify you, all the nations. Did you catch that? So when you look at this, concept in Psalm 86, he, he's basically quoting this psalm, and this becomes what they say here, great and marvelous are your works, right? He says, we're going to glorify your name. You alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Now, the word worship in Hebrew is one of the, one of the ones for bowing down is 
shakha, shakha, to bow down or lay prostrate on the ground to do homage or obeisance to or before someone with great authority, especially to honor God. And so the idea of bowing oneself in posture, it's a posture of worship. It's a physical posture that's supposed to reflect an inner posture, that our spirit should be humble before God, right? Now, one of the stories we read about when it comes to worship is the woman with the, uh, that was at the well, the Samaritan woman that we just read about. And there is a parable that we should understand here. And when we look at the parable about worshiping God, look what it says here. It says, Jesus was questioned by some of the scribes and Pharisees concerning some of his disciples eating bread with defiled or washed hands. They had a tradition of ceremony washing their hands before eating as the priesthood was commanded to do in the temple. Clean hands reflected a what? Clean heart to serve or worship God. Based upon King David's words in Psalm 22, 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. This prayer and practice of saying a Hebrew blessing for washing one's hands ha as known, uh, 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 was known to be one of the traditions of the elders. So when the Bible talks about the tradition of the elders, this is one of them. You had to wash your hands before. Uh, this rabbinical instruction of the Pharisees is still practiced today in Israel and present Orthodox Judaism throughout the world. As helpful as this tradition was as a purity law, keep your hands pure, for Israel to remain as a holy nation or a kingdom of priests, it often downgraded into a legalistic prohibition and a heartless practice, void of any spiritual power or application. Look at this parable that Jesus used to unveil their vain worship and reveal the true heart of of worship. So we see here in Matthew 15, 1 through 9, they ask the question, why do your disciples break this tradition? What was the tradition? Washing the hands. And uh, he says, but you guys break the tradition. Instead of taking care of your mother and your father, you say, oh, all my money is going to go for a special offering at the temple or a special vow, so I can't help mom and dad. I'm sorry. I've already designated that money. Really? That was an excuse. And so he says, you break this tradition all the time in verses 4 through 6. But look at the end of 6. It says, thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your what? Tradition. He says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Look at verse 9. And in vain they what? Worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Meaning these were not commandments of God. They're man's commandments. But you'll break God's command to keep man's tradition. He says, don't you know that's vain worship? So what's the opposite of vain worship? True worship. So this is where we kind of tie it into the woman at the well because she was taught about true worship and they were going back and forth between this place in the... Uh, uh, the Samaritan, uh, Samaria a region of Israel and Jerusalem where the temple was at where all this hand washing was basically taking place. The hand washing was based upon a tradition that if we're called a holy nation and we're supposed to be Israel, a, a kingdom of priests, then it's not just the Levites that have to wash their hands in the temple. Every time we come to the temple, we should wash our hands and feet. Some would even wash or immerse their whole body in water as if they're being baptized every time they would go just to say, I'm clean before God. And it was a beautiful tradition. It's still a beautiful tradition. But if you're going to keep tradition over God's command, then you're keeping commandments of men, which could be nice, but it wouldn't be better for you to keep God's command. So take care of your, uh, your father and your mother. So Amen. stop making tradition out of something that was just purely tradition. It should have been honor your father and your mother, and they didn't want to do that. So he says, you're just as guilty. So we can do a fill-in today of what we can learn from this is that God wants our hearts in worship for an intimate connection. We keep talking about worship is all about staying connected to our Heavenly Father. Yes, you can sing. Yes, you can pray. Yes, you can read the Word of God. But down to the bottom understanding, it's all about a connection with God, right? Next, our hearts can stay undefiled through worship because he was talking about the fact that these people were defiled. 
They were concerned with, with the disciples having defiled hands because it was believed in those days if you didn't wash your hands and say the little Hebrew blessing that, I mean, I, I say it every time we do Passover when we do the washing of hands like Jesus washes the feet, we, we say the blessing. But you can actually have undefiled hands but have defiled hearts. Mm -hmm. And that's what some of these Pharisees had. Uh, third, you see, um, so that's undefiled and worship fill in. Our hearts can stay undefiled with worship. The third one is this, that our hearts, uh, excuse me, that worship gives us access to draw close to God. The purpose of worship is to give us access to draw close to God. So this is why they, when they went to the temple, there was only one way into the temple because Jesus is the way. And the priests understood the truth of what was going on because Jesus is the truth. Mm -hmm. And then the life was what they experienced when the presence of God was in behind the veil. Mm -hmm. the presence of God, that was the life. So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's like the, the door to the tabernacle. He's like the, the, um, the entryway. He is the truth inside of it. He is the life behind the veil. He's all that revelation. He literally is a tabernacle among us, right? And that's what we should do. We should tabernacle with God. So let's see if we can look at the last villain. True worship empowers our whole life to honor God. True worship empowers not just our singing, our whole life to worship God. Amen? All right. So Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Jesus always answered a question with a deeper question which is a typical style of communication in the Jewish world. Remember, I shared this on Sunday. The purpose is to go beyond the surface question and cut to the heart of the matter. Jesus always targets an issue of an iniquity to a heart matter, which is the core of man's being and center focus of God's aim. The Father in heaven seeks worshipers that worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. Jesus even quoted the prophet Isaiah to describe true worship that is not in vain or empty. If people draw near to God with their mouth and only honor him with their lips, but their heart is far from him, this is considered vain worship. In other words, it's not true worship because your heart's not engaged. Your spirit's not engaged because you don't have that connection with him. You're just lifting hands, looking around, seeing what everybody else is doing, but you're not getting anything out of it. You can, you're, you're playing the music in your car, but you're not even listening to the words. One of the things I do when I go around the block, I was this one song that I play all the time, and it's Yeshua. Yeshua, ah, 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 ah. They did that Wednesday night. It was so beautiful. I didn't know they were going to do it, but they did it kind of to bless my socks off, right? All of a sudden, they start singing Yeshua. I said, come on. They learned the song. And there's this one version of it that I, I shared about a week ago. I should share it again with all of you so you can have it. Um, it gets to this beautiful moment where the guy says, it's a pastor who's on this worship collaboration, he says that we're not in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> I love that part of the song, we're not in a hurry. And, and, and it's almost like the person saying, let's stop rushing, let's just kind of acknowledge he's here. Because true worship means to not be unaware of his presence, mm -hmm. not to be unaware of something. To be ignorant is the opposite of being uh, or understanding truth. So when you're ignorant of something, you're not aware of something. And sometimes we're unaware that God is with us. We're unaware that his presence is around us. He, he, you're unaware that God lives inside you, that you can worship God anywhere in any place at any time because he lives in you, amen? You are the temple that we're actually making sure is clean for him to dwell in. Okay, so obviously to worship God in spirit and truth is to worship God with a true heart that is genuine and not defiled by what? Hypocrisy. Let's look at the parable that Jesus uses to teach us about true worship from hearts that are undefiled. Here it is. Here's the actual parable, Matthew 15, 10. Notice we, we just kind of continued in the chapter, right? When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. He's about to give the parable. He just finished talking about hands being defiled and hearts being defiled because they said you weren't washing your hands. Your hands are defiled, meaning what you eat now is defiled. So look what he says. He says, now what goes into the mouth defiles a man. Excuse me, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, 
do you know that the Pharisees were offended when you, they heard you say this? You know, there's times where I've preached things and I've said things, people say, I was offended by what you said. I had one man come up to me and say, you know, one time in counseling you said something to me, uh, to me and my wife and I thought you were taking her side and you were telling me I, I needed to focus on this or that or whatever and I was mad at you for years. I stopped coming to church and then I realized when I went to another church, when I got into a leadership position, that everything you had taught me I was saying to another couple. Oh, wow. And I realized Beautiful. it hit him like Rabbi was right all along. Oh. So he comes back to Destiny full circle. He comes up to me out of nowhere in the in the in the in the, in the, um, in, the in the prayer room or the the um, the green room uh, behind the the sanctuary um, behind the stage, and he comes up to me and says, "Rabbi, I have to tell you something." I said, "What do you have to tell me?" And he goes, "I was mad at you back in the day when you counseled me and my wife." I said, "You were? Oh, I'm so sorry." What did I? Oh no no, I'm over it now because I realized you were right all along. I shouldn't have been offended. And he goes, everything you said came to pass as I was sharing the same thing you were telling me to someone else. And I was realizing I got that from you. And I realized that I got over it through a lot of extra counseling I had to do through my work and job, whatever. But I realized everything you told me was exactly what I needed to hear. I just didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And what's so funny about it is he was offended. He never came to me and told me. I would have said, you know, I'm so sorry you were offended, but let me explain to you why I said that to him. I could have helped him in his journey. He wouldn't have had to do the full whole walking in the wilderness for 40 years to finally get to the promised land. But that's exactly what happened here. The Pharisees, don't you know, they were a little upset, upset or offended by what you said? Verse 13 says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted would be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders, or they are blind leaders of the blind, it says. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable. In other words, he understood that this was a parable. So in other words, we have to realize that worship is not just something we sing uh, or words of praise that we declare. Worship is a lifestyle that brings God glory in everything that we say and do. Being a worshiper is just who we are and why we were created. Our lives, our families, or even our careers have the ability to establish God's praise in the earth as we surrender to his will and fulfill his ultimate plan. We establish the awareness of his presence in the world he created. So I want you to think, go back to this idea of this parable. What uh, goes into the man is not necessarily what defiles him. What comes out of him defiles him. So in other words, Jesus was saying the most important thing about worship is that your heart's not defiled. Because they were offended. You know, when people show that they were offended, there's something in their heart that's not right. They couldn't receive the good seed of the word of God in good soil because the weeds, right? Because of the, the rocks and the thorns and the thistles, it's choking the seed's potential. And he says that's exactly what happens with these Pharisees. There's something in their life that needs to be uprooted. Their hearts are defiled. So tonight we're going to close out with some final thoughts on worship. Number one, worship has to be spiritual. Worship must be spiritual because worshipers spiritually see God as their father in worship so their spirit can commune with him. Remember, again, it's that intimate connection that your spirit has with God's spirit, right? Or with God who is a spirit through the Holy Spirit. The second thing we see is that it has to be authentic. To stay true in intention and authentic in, ex in expression as they dedicate themselves to God. Worshipers must stay true in intention and authentic in ex expression as they dedicate themselves to God. Remember, someone who's a worshiper is devoted to God. They're dedicated to God. How many would say that you are a worshiper? How many could get more dedicated, more devoted in your worship? Okay, good. So you're already a worshiper. You can just get more dedicated in that worship. Third, it has to be transparent because worshipers must keep their hearts pure and open to God in transparency and truthfulness. Remember, it has to be in truth. If you're not being true to God, you can't like do a crime Saturday night and come worship a God with pure hands and pure heart on Sunday morning if you haven't confessed that sin, right? You, you, you need to come clean. True worship means what's happening on the inside is also happening on the outside. So if your hands are up, or you're praising, you're shouting, you're saying amen, but yet your heart is defiled, 
then it's not true worship. God doesn't see it because you haven't bowed before him. You haven't surrendered to him, right? And then lastly, it must be sincere. It's got to be sincere. If you're going to be a worshiper of God, you must stay true and genuine in your devotion and must be undefiled in your character, right? Worshippers must stay true and genuine in their devotion and undefiled in their character. So how many want to have a worship experience that is spiritual, authentic, transparent, and sincere? Because think about it. If it's not spiritual, then it's carnal and fleshly. It's only an outward expression. It's no inward change. If it's not authentic, it's not real. If it's not transparent, then how can there be truthfulness, right? And if it's not sincere, then how can there be a, a, a character that's undefiled? You've got to be sincere. If you tell someone you love them, you've got to be sincere. How many know when you worship God, you want sincere worship? When you say, God, I love you. We were singing on Sunday, I love you, Lord, second service. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. And let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Think about how sincere your worship is that to God it's a sweet sound. It's a sweet fragrance. It's a sweet aroma. That's the life that he wants you to have. Amen? Amen. All right, let's do our declarations tonight. Come on, on the count of three. One, two, three. I am a worshiper of God. I am a servant of God. I am submitted. I am surrendered. I am sincere. I am dedicated. I am devoted. Come on. This is how you need to view yourself this week as a worshiper of God. Now, as you do that, don't forget the verses you're supposed to read that are the extra reading verses to take time to read supporting verses, as well as all of the applications to what you have learned. They're always the same except for the last one. The last one is create an environment of worship in your home for at least 30 minutes at a time. Now, when you really start worshiping God, you stop tracking time. But at least try, I've not done this before, 30 minutes of some worship, maybe open your Bible up. You ladies want to light a candle, light a candle, you know, but don't do one to Mary. You just do one that's a fragrant candle. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, but that's the way I pray. Well, I, I, I understand, but let's go deeper than that, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, Mary called God her Savior. That means unlike the Immaculate Conception theology or doctrine, she needed a savior too, because she had sin in her life just like anybody else, but she was a willing vessel. So I, I honor Mary as if she was a willing vessel. I just don't put her on the level of Jesus or the level of God, amen? Because I don't pray to her because I pray to God direct. So I don't need to pray to her because I don't need another mediator when there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus, amen? But I still honor her and respect her, but she was the vessel that brought our Savior into the world. Amen. Let's not dishonor her because, oh, I don't believe that Catholic doctrine. Well, hey, but at least Catholics do have an honor for Mary. Yeah. And they just should never put her on the level of an idol, remember, because that's vain worship, yeah. right? Yeah. But she doesn't, nowhere in the Bible does it say she's supposed to pray for you. You pray for yourself. But if you want someone to pray for you, you have someone already. Jesus is praying for you, and you and I are praying for one another. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and just close out with our action step for the night. And that is for you to take the next step in your walk with God by signing up for the worship team or audio team or media team to help grow our worship experience at Destiny. Now, this could even be a part of the whole what we call production. It doesn't mean you're going to be singing on stage. It means you could be part of the person putting the lyrics, you know, working with lights, working with it. We'll, we'll find something for you to do that will enhance our worship experience. So every week we give you a little action step. Do you guys enjoy tonight? Yeah. Let's close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we can be worshipers, not just singers and dancers and praisers and musicians, but Father, the kind of worshiper that gives glory to you in all that we do, whether at home, in our jobs, 
in the streets, where we're walking every day, giving you praise, glory, and honor, giving you all the credit, Father, that you deserve the worship, Father, that we worship you in spirit and in truth. In the beauty of holiness, we give you that praise and that honor because holiness is our lifestyle. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will make us the vessel you want us to be, to make us a temple that you can dwell in and that the presence of God will not only rest in us, be all around us, that we'll be aware of your presence every day in everything that we think, say, and do, and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. You. Bye, online audience. We love you. See you next time.